morning. My name is Raymond Adams. I was a vicar for many years in the Diocese of Bristol, but uh, we recently retired to Hereford. Now, over the years, I've horrified a number of congregations by telling them that there is a page in the Bible that I would dearly love to tear out. And there is. It's this one. That blank page that you can see there that separates the Old Testament from the New Testament. This page suggests that the story of God's dealings uh, with Israel in the Old Testament can safely be put behind us as we now focus on the New Testament, on Jesus and his kingdom. But this would be a real mistake because actually Jesus saw his mission and his kingdom entirely through the lens of the Old Testament. And it was through reading and studying its pages that he came to realise what kind of Messiah he was to be. Hebrews actually makes it clear that the New Testament is much better than the Old Testament in all kinds of ways. Not least, says the writer, because the New Testament is founded on better promises. He goes so far as to say that if there had been nothing wrong with the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, we wouldn't have needed a new one. But no, there was, he says, a lot lacking with it. We know that the Old Testament is incomplete. It's longing for fulfilment. The New Testament, on the other hand, is God's final word to the human race through his son Jesus Christ. But that being said, we must never forget that the New Testament is built on the foundations of the Old Testament. And nowhere do we see this more clearly, I think, than in the story we're looking at today, the story of the Transfiguration. But before we look in detail at that, let me just explain to you by an illustration what I've been saying. Way back in 1995, when I was dropping my kids off at the school gates, I met a member of my congregation, Pat was incredibly excited. Oh, she says, David has gone to get us a new PC from PC World. We're getting a brand new computer. Okay, I thought, no big deal. I've got a computer already. In fact, it was the Amstrad PCW, if you remember that, made by Lord Sugar. No, she said, you don't understand. This new computer, it's Windows. I said, what's Windows? And Pat replied, I don't really know, but I know it's going to be great. And it was great. It was so great that I'm afraid Bill Gates' message ultimately to Lord Sugar was, you're fired. Now, Windows 11, which I've now got, is new and marvellous. But you couldn't, you couldn't really call it new in the sense of brand new. It's rather more of an upgrade. It's, built, it's building on all that's gone before. Now, you, some people might say, I don't understand why we have to have all these Windows 8s, 9s, 10s, 11s, all the rest of it. I mean, back in 1995, when Pat got her computer, we got Windows Vista. And you might say, why do we need Windows 11 when we have perfectly good Windows Vista? Well, if you ever used Windows Vista, then you could say, along with the writer to the Hebrews, if there'd been nothing wrong with Windows Vista, we'd never have needed Windows 11. But there was, and we did. Now, this should help us to understand the story of the Transfiguration, because actually it's not new, not in the sense of being brand new. It's actually an upgrade. It's an upgrade of a story we've already had in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. It's just that this time, when we have it again, it's so much more glorious. Now you might be sitting there thinking, what's he talking about? The transfiguration in the Old Testament? I don't remember that. Well, Let's go back to Exodus 24. Exodus 24 is in some ways Windows Vista and Mark chapter 9 in the New Testament 
is very much Windows 11. Both stories, you see, start in exactly the same way. In the Old Testament, four men climb a mountain, a very high mountain. In Exodus, Moses summons Aaron, the chief priest, and his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, to accompany him, and they all get to the top of Mount Sinai together. In Mark's Gospel, they're not climbing Mount Sinai, they're climbing, we think, Mount Tabor, 10,000 feet to the top. And Jesus calls James and Peter and John. And by the time they get to the top, like the four men from the Old Testament, the four men in the New are all shattered. It's a 10,000 feet climb. Now, here's an interesting point, first of all. Matthew and Mark give us a very specific time reference, pointing out that Jesus set off after six days. After six days. Keep that figure in your head. Now, they have no real idea, uh, that, that is James, Peter and John, what they're going to see when they get to the top of the mountain. In fact, uh, Luke seems to suggest they just kind of settle down to, to pop off to sleep for the night. But they're soon awakened and joined by three very important characters from the Old Testament. First of all, Moses and Elijah, and then at the end of the story, much more importantly, a cloud. Now, I shouldn't really put those three on the same level, Moses, Elijah, and the cloud, because if you know your Old Testament, you'll know who that cloud represents, and, of course, why Peter and the other disciples were so scared. Yahweh led the people of Israel in a cloud, or by a cloud. It was the same cloud that filled Moses' tabernacle in the desert when it was inaugurated, and the same cloud that filled Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And here, in Exodus 14, we read that God appears in a cloud covering Mount Sinai, and he covers Mount Sinai for six days. Six days. Well, we've heard that before. Moses must wait six days before he is permitted to enter the cloud when he hears the voice speaking to him. And Jesus waits six days before he climbs the mountain. I'm sure that's not a coincidence. It's there, Mark pointing us back to the other story. Now, once uh, this uh, event takes place, Moses and Elijah are having a conversation with Jesus. Let's just focus on Moses first of all. In fact, let's focus on Moses entirely. We haven't really got time to look at Elijah. Moses, was a, he knew something big was coming. And uh, before he died, he told the Israelites about it. You see, he actually gave a prophecy uh, not long before he died. He said, there's a prophet like me who is coming. Now, that might sound like perhaps a bit big headed. Uh, but let's stop to think. Moses spoke to God, we're told, face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. Now, that's pretty unique, to speak to God as you would talk to your friend. Imagine sitting in a coffee shop. Well, Moses did something similar. He met God regularly in the tent of meeting. Well, after his death, would there be anybody else ever like that again? Aaron didn't have that experience. None of the other Israelites had. They all had to step back, stay away. But Moses was able to go in and have these conversations with God. Would there ever be anyone like that again? Oh yes, said Moses, there will. Don't worry about it, there will. In Deuteronomy 18.15, he says this, God will raise up another prophet like me among your fellow Israelites, and when he comes, you must listen to him. Listen to him. Again, where have you heard that before in the story of the transfiguration? Well, clearly it's from the mouth of God speaking from the cloud. Listen to him. Listen to that prophet, says Moses to his people in the Old Testament. Listen to him. Listen to my son. That's what Yahweh says to his people in the New Testament. 
So what are we to make of this strange apparition? Jesus becomes luminous before Peter and James and John. Now, I don't care how expensive your washing powder is. Mark says you'll never get your clothes to shine like this. I mean, if I was talking to children, I might say that, you know, you could take a, a torch, a very, very bright torch and put it under your T-shirt and shine it. And that way you get some idea, perhaps, of what was going on here. Jesus' bright light shines right the way through his clothing. And so the question, I guess, is why has he taken on this strange new appearance? The answer, of course, is that it's not new at all. There's nothing new about it. We are seeing Jesus as he was before Bethlehem, before he was born in, uh, in uh, the uh, reign of, of Tiberius Caesar. He had a life before that. He had a life from eternity with God his father and we are seeing him as he was in that previous life we're seeing jesus as he was when he was with god the father and as he will be again as we shall see him again in the future his clothes shone with that heavenly glory so you see he's not changing into something else he's actually just revealing the glory that he already shares with his father and has shared with his father from all eternity. It's actually the high watermark of the Gospels, the high watermark of the revelation of Jesus in the Gospels. Now, we, we've lived for many years in Swindon, uh, for over 30, 32 years in Swindon, and one thing Swindon doesn't have is a river. Well, it's a bit different from Hereford in that case, because you Herefordians know all about rivers and high water marks. It's quite interesting going around the city looking to see the, where the water reached in 1950 or 1970 or wherever. Well, here we've got a high water mark. This is where Jesus is absolutely revealed as who he is. And the witnesses from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, are there to see it. See, I guess Moses, when he gave his prophecy, at that time, that there's someone coming, another prophet like me didn't really know who was coming, didn't really have any idea who this person actually was. But when he sees him face to face, it's truly remarkable. And at this point, Peter says something pretty stupid, right on cue, as he admits himself. I said the first thing that came into my head. Because actually we know that Mark gets his gospel from Peter. Uh, that's where he, he, he got it. Peter, Peter tells the stories to Mark and, and often paints himself in a, in a very bad light. He doesn't hide his foolishness or, his, or the things he says. And, you know, this really underlines the truth of this story for me. If you wanted to portray Jesus as the eternal God, as Mark is doing here, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, would you then put a pin in the account? by relating the foolish statement of one of the onlookers. I mean, why record his words at all if they're that stupid, if they're that foolish? Well, I guess, because that's how it happened. Peter actually talks in one of his letters about this event. He says, the account of the transfiguration was, is factual. It's not a work of our imagination. He puts it this way. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were witnesses of his majesty. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves, he says, heard this voice that came from, them, from heaven while we were with him on that sacred mountain. In other words, these things we're telling you, they're not, they're not just stories that we fishermen wove along with our fishing nets. This actually occurred. And in the middle of all this glory, with these sacred witnesses beside me, I, I blurted out this offer. Oh, oh, just, just let me build three, three tabernacles. What a great thing we are to be here. I, I, I can build you three tabernacles. Uh, look, let me build a shelter for St. Moses, a shelter for St. Elijah, and a shelter for St. Jesus. 
the voice comes, I was going to say, as a correction. It actually comes rather more, I think, as a rebuke to this rather misguided offer. Don't, says God, speaking from the cloud, do not put my son Jesus on the same plane as Moses and Elijah. As Hebrews puts it, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. But Christ is faithful as a son. He is a whole new category. Why did Peter want to do that? Well, the commentary say, oh, he probably wanted just to prolong the experience. But you might think, if Peter was as terrified as he admits he was, then you'd think prolonging the experience is the last thing he'd want to do. But I was just reading Matthew's Gospel this week, and I discovered that it's possible for someone to feel both great fear, not to say terror. It doesn't stop them from feeling another emotion as well. Right at the end of Matthew's Gospel, when the two women encounter the angel at the tomb and find the tomb is empty, they, they run off to get the disciples, and we're told that they are very afraid Yes, you would be, but also filled with great joy. The two emotions somehow managed to reside together simultaneously in their hearts. And back in the Old Testament, the Israelites were similarly terrified at times. When Moses talked with God face to face, we're told that on leaving the tent of meeting, his face shone. It was a pretty expe scary experience for the Israelites around him. And yet, what he was doing was simply reflecting the light of Yahweh. Moses was in some ways like the moon. When we're children, we think the moon's got its own light. It's only later we realise that it's merely reflecting the light of the sun. This is why Jesus is different again from Moses. Jesus is not reflecting the light that is Yahweh. Rather, he is shining with his own internal light. In other words, his brightness isn't just coming from outside of him. It's coming from inside. We're seeing him as he is, one with God. Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. So, the transfiguration needs to be understood through the Old Testament. Four men climb up a mountain in the Old Testament and the New. In both the Old and the New, there's a six-day wait for them to hear the voice of God from a cloud. We have in the New Testament story, Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets coming together. There's no blank page. The New and the Old Testament coalesce there as these great figures talk together on the mountain. Moses speaks of the prophet to come in Deuteronomy and he's waiting to see what kind of prophet this will be. All he knows is that when he comes we must listen to him. The very words that come out of Yahweh, the very words that come out of God through the cloud to Peter, James and John and of course also to us hearing the story today. Listen to him. And finally, one last word. We're told in Luke's Gospel what they chatted about. Jesus, Moses and Elijah. What were they talking about? Well, it says quite clearly they spoke about his departure, that is Jesus' departure at Jerusalem. Now there are many words that could be used for departure in Greek, but Luke prefers to use the word exodus. They spoke, Luke says, about Jesus' exodus. You see, just as Moses birthed, in a sense, the nation of Israel in the original exodus, taking those people who, who, who left Egypt as slaves and giving them freedom and liberty, so Jesus is now producing in his day a new people and a new kingdom over which he will be king forever, not just one nation as in the past. 
but this applies, this offer is for the whole world, for every nation on the face of our planet. Well, here my illustration about Windows breaks down. There will, I am sure, be a Windows 12 and no doubt a Windows 13 and 14 after that, but there won't be anything more from God in the scriptures. God has a spoken, we're told, his final word in Jesus. There can never be a better, there can never be more to be said than God has said to us in his word. But that doesn't mean there isn't more for us to experience. You see, John says in his prologue, we saw him with our eyes. We beheld his glory. And here's the wonderful truth that if we are part of Christ's Exodus people, we too will see him one day in all his glory with our own eyes. What a day that's going to be. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your faithfulness down the centuries and down the generations and we thank you for what you reveal of your son Jesus to us in your word. We thank you that one day we will open our eyes and see Jesus face to face. Amen. Say